I am Lauren Summers. I'm Senior Director of Lifelong Learning and Travel at the Yale Alumni Association and Yale Alumni Academy. And I'm very pleased to welcome here today our uh, distinguished guest, Professor Paul Sabin. He is uh, class of 92, Randolph W. Townsend, Jr. Professor of History at Yale University, where he teaches and writes about environmental and energy history and US political and legal history. Professor Sabin is faculty director for the Yale Environmental Humanities Program, and he coordinates the Yale Environmental History Working Group. This presentation today, we're having a chance to talk about his new book, Public Citizen, The Attack on Big Government and the Remaking of American Liberalism. And that was published by Norton in 2021. The book examines the evolution and impact of public interest environmental law movement in the United States since the 1960s. Uh, Professor Sabin's previous book, The Bet, um, was published by Yale University Press in 2013. And that uh, subtitle is Paul Ehrlich, Julian Simon, and our gamble over Earth's future. It's a minor little topic that Professor Sabin <laughs> wrote about back then. And it explores the contentious debates over population growth and resource scarcity. His first book, Crude Politics, the California Oil Market from 1900 to 1940 was published by uh, University of California Press in 2005. And it looks at how politics and law shaped a growing dependence on petroleum in California and the nation. Uh, I, I think it's important to look at the context of all these books together because it gives a sense of the breadth of topics that are covered by the Environmental Humanities Program, and also that we'll have a chance to talk um, with Professor Sabin about today. So without further ado, I'm going to pass it to you, Professor Sabin, to get us going. Thank you. Great. Great. Lauren, thank you so much uh, for having me, and, uh, and thank you everyone for coming today. I'm really looking forward to, uh, to our discussion. Uh, I'm just going to uh, share my screen here. Um, but I want to thank, uh, thank you, Lauren, for the introduction, and thank you, everyone, uh, so much for uh, joining today. I'm really looking forward to our, uh, our conversation. Um, and as Lauren said, I study and teach uh, about the history of energy and environmental uh, politics, um, and had those uh, two books that she mentioned uh, before on, uh, uh, you know, prior to public citizens, crude politics about oil uh, politics and law in California in the early 20th century, and then the bet about uh, resource scarce debates over resource scarcity and population growth uh, since the uh, 1960s. Um, and it's also worth mentioning that before I uh, came to uh, uh, Yale, I also I, I founded and led for for nine years, uh, the nonprofit uh, Environmental Leadership Program, uh, which is a national uh, nonprofit organization uh, that seeks to train and support uh, a new generation of environmental leaders. Uh, and the nonprofit uh, reflects my commitment to environmental and social change, uh, and also my belief in the value uh, of reflection and perspective uh, and deeper understanding uh, within uh, environmental and social justice movements. Uh, and it's in that context that I wrote uh, Public Citizens. And I think it's uh, worth kind of, uh, gi giving that context because uh, I I'm trying to kind of deepen our understanding of uh, you know, our, our environmental politics and kind of thinking about uh, you know, liberal approaches to governance um, from a, 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 a humble and uh, self-reflective uh, perspective. Public citizens uh, started um, with a desire to understand the new environmental legislation of the early 1970s uh, and the creation uh, of new environmental law and science uh, groups like the uh, Natural Resources Defense Council, um, the Environmental Defense Fund, uh, and other groups. Uh, and it's a particularly suitable topic for uh, Yale Alumni Academy uh, talk uh, because of the pro very prominent role uh, of Yale graduates uh, in those organizations and in the environmental field uh, more broadly. As I got more uh, deeply into my research, uh, particularly the period between uh, 1968 and 1972, uh, I found the same thing uh, repeatedly uh, in the founding documents of these organizations uh, and in the rhetoric of their leaders. Uh, and that was uh, an attack on uh, government agencies for having lost their way, uh, for no longer uh, representing the public interest. Agencies uh, in this view uh, either had been captured by industry uh, or were pursuing their own uh, misguided uh, plans. And in the process, my topics uh, shifted somewhat from environmental regulation uh, specifically uh, to a new focus on the relationship between liberals uh, and the government. And I sought to uh, understand better the decline of a big government liberalism 
in the 1960s and the 1970s. How did we go from Lyndon Johnson's uh, Great Society uh, to Ronald Reagan's uh, Conservative Revolution in just uh, 15 or so years? Uh, and what part did liberal uh, activists uh, play in it? So today I want to give you uh, a, an overview of my book uh, in a talk running uh, around 30 or 35 minutes or so. Uh, and then I'd love to hear your uh, thoughts uh, and answer your, uh, your, your questions. Um, so uh, with, uh, with, that, uh, with that context, um, here goes. How uh, did government go from being the uh, solution to society's ills uh, to being perceived as a chief cause uh, of its problems? Uh, the answer, paradoxically, uh, lies with the political left uh, as well as the right. Uh, in the 1960s uh, and in the uh, and 1970s, as the federal government expanded its reach uh, and as a growing conservative movement culminated uh, against it, many liberals also grew disillusioned with the government's unchecked bureaucratic power. A post-war liberal faith in government crashed uh, against the realities of how that government was working, its excessively close ties uh, with industry, uh, and what it was doing to uh, the American people and to the land itself. Citizen advocates turned to new nonprofit organizations uh, to protect a public interest uh, that the government, they argued, did not reliably serve. Under pressure from both the left and the right, uh, the traditional liberal establishment, I argue, fell into disarray. In Public Citizens, I examine this historical moment uh, when liberals themselves helped break apart the post-war liberal uh, coalition uh, that had supported a strong uh, and active federal government. Both intentionally uh, and also uh, unwittingly, uh, their campaign successes helped to make it harder for government uh, to do big things. Today, with an onslaught of attacks on the regulatory state uh, coming from the right, uh, it may seem counterintuitive uh, to study the left's criticisms of government. But in the late 1960s and in the early 1970s, it was as if liberals took the big government bicycle uh, apart uh, to fix it, uh, and then they couldn't quite figure out uh, how to get it running uh, properly again. Uh, now, as the government seeks to tackle uh, urgent challenges like housing, uh, transportation, and renewable energy, uh, and to address the ongoing uh, public health situation with the pandemic, uh, it's an opportune moment uh, to revisit this uh, period of time. Let's see if I can get this to forward here. How are these uh, slides uh, working? Looks good. Good. We're okay. looking at the dam. Great. All right. Uh, uh, the New Deal and the uh, Second World War created a kind of managed capitalism uh, in the United States that generated rising wages and uh, strong economic growth. In his influential 1952 book, uh, American Capitalism, uh, the economist John Kenneth Galbraith articulated a liberal conception of, quote, countervailing powers uh, that were held in balance by the regulatory state. Uh, large businesses would uh, check one another's excesses through competition, uh, and powerful unions uh, would represent the interests of workers. Government would pay, play a crucial role, uh, ensuring that the system did not tilt too far in one direction uh, or the other. Uh, and Galbraith called this balancing role perhaps the major peacetime function uh, of the federal government. In this economic system of the 1950s, the federal government actively partnered with industries uh, and frequently initiated transformative infrastructure projects. After the uh, triumphant completion of Hoover Dam uh, and Grand uh, Coulee Dam, uh, pictured here, uh, major hydroelectric dam construction accelerated in the 1940s and 50s, spurred on by agencies such as the Bureau of Reclamation uh, and also uh, the Tennessee uh, Valley Authority. Kaiser, uh, Bechtel, uh, and other leading engineering and construction companies use government dam contracts to expand domestically uh, and also uh, overseas. Um, writing in 1950, the historian uh, and prominent liberal uh, Henry Steele Cominger uh, celebrated the Tennessee Valley Authority as, quote, the greatest peacetime achievement of 20th century uh, America. TVA, uh, Cominger said, uh, quote, triumphantly allied uh, science and politics and showed that the public intelligence can operate most effectively through government uh, and that government can be more efficient uh, than business. TVA imagined uh, government planners uh, using federal money to remake a uh, multi-state region, uh, uh, controlling its rivers, stimulating its economy uh, and transforming uh, the societies. Uh, they, uh, what God had made one, uh, you know, David Lilienthal, uh, the uh, head of uh, TVA said, man was to develop uh, as one. 
Uh, and he characterized TVA's leaders uh, as, quote, dreamers uh, with shovels in their hands. The uh, Federal Highway Program further accelerated a post-war construction boom, establishing toll-free highways that linked major cities. President Dwight uh, Eisenhower called highways a, quote, public enterprise that was a, quote, obligation of government at every level. Labor, capital, and government uh, were working in tandem uh, here to fuel the post-war economic boom, remaking the American landscape to manage water, energy, transportation, uh, and housing. In New York, uh, urban planners like uh, Robert Moses uh, followed this agency-led development model to dramatically uh, alter the region's infrastructure, uh, building highways and bridges, uh, parks, uh, and more. It was uh, against this uh, conjunction of administrative power uh, the post-war alliance of big government, big business, and big labor, uh, that best-selling authors uh, such as Jane Jacobs, uh, Rachel Carson, and Ralph Nader rose up in full-throated opposition uh, in the early 1960s. Jacob, Jacobs wrote in the, uh, in the first sentence of, uh, of the death and life of uh, great American cities, quote, this, this book is an attack on current city planning and rebuilding. Government planners, she said uh, elsewhere, were, quote, ravaging our cities. Uh, Rachel Carson, uh, author of the 1962 bestseller, uh, Silent Spring, similarly called for greater attention uh, to community, the environment, uh, and the ordinary citizen. Excessively close ties between government uh, and industry, Carson argued, uh, exacerbated a misguided uh, vision of a simplified, pest-free environment. Government campaigns against the gypsy moth and the fire ant, uh, Carson wrote, were, quote, ill-conceived, badly executed, and thoroughly detrimental. Carson's critique of, uh, of, of the quest for biological control lacked the concentrated power uh, of government institutions that too often uh, represented industry's perspective. The fundamental wrong, Carson explained uh, in a 1963 speech, quote, is the authoritarian control that has been vested in the agricultural agencies. Carson's skepticism about the government adequately representing the public interest uh, echoed through, uh, through the growing environmental movement over the next decade. Quote, people are beginning to ask questions uh, instead of meekly acquiescing, uh, Carson wrote, of mounting citizen opposition to pesticide spray programs. Americans had to wake up to their civic responsibilities uh, and stop trusting the government to act responsibly, she argued. Until very recently, she said, the average citizen assumed that someone uh, was looking after these matters and that some little understood but confidently relied upon safeguards, uh, stood like shields between his person and any harm. Now he has experienced from several different directions uh, a rather rude shattering uh, of these beliefs. In his uh, 1965 book, uh, Unsafe at Any Speed, Ralph Nader, uh, like Carson, uh, blamed the government uh, as well as industry for the problems he identified. The traffic safety establishment, Nader wrote, uh, was a great power with no challengers. Nader called on active citizens, including independent, civically active uh, lawyers, uh, engineers, uh, and scientists, uh, to force the government uh, to protect American consumers from dangerous cars and from badly designed uh, roads. Nader urged a, what he called a uh, bodily rights revolution uh, that would protect American citizens against manifold uh, external threats uh, from industry uh, and government. Automobile accidents uh, in this uh, context were a form of environmental uh, issue. They're one of the most serious man-made assaults uh, on the human body. Uh, and Nader's safety campaign uh, later extended to his advocacy uh, for other things that were assaulting uh, the human body and also the natural environment. Uh, his, his campaign for clean air, for clean water, for safer workplaces, uh, and also his uh, fervent opposition uh, to toxic chemicals uh, and nuclear power. During the spring and summer of uh, 1966, uh, Ralph Nader emerged as a spokesperson uh, and a key broker on important new highway safety uh, legislation. In the closing moments of, uh, of, of, uh, um, of legislative drafting, Nader sat in one, uh, one Senate uh, anti-room uh, well, Lloyd Cutler, uh, a Democratic lobbyist uh, representing the auto industry, uh, stayed in another. A Senate aide went back and forth uh, between Nader and Cutler uh, as they hammered out the bill's uh, final details. Uh, and this was both literally and symbolically was a, a situation in which the old Democratic Party establishment uh, with its governmental and uh, business ties 
uh, was being forced to negotiate with uh, one of its new liberal critics. Nader and uh, other uh, citizens, uh, citizen activists, were searching for ways uh, to build something larger than uh, individual, uh, individual crusades. Uh, they aimed to enlist young, uh, energetic young researchers and professionals uh, to press government agencies to fulfill their public uh, missions uh, and their regulatory roles. The media, uh, the courts, uh, and administrative and legislative processes um, would be their field uh, of operation. Uh, and in the summer of 1969, here you can see Nader uh, posing with a, a small army of what they came to call Nader's Raiders uh, on the steps of the Capitol. Uh, and and they, these, these were a uh, hundred or so uh, um, uh, um, young, uh, young lawyer, young law students and other students coming down uh, to uh, investigate the government and churn out reports on different governmental uh, agencies. Notable uh, liberal foundations, including Ford and Carnegie, uh, played important roles launching this new public uh, interest law movement. Ford's generous grants, totaling more than $2 million from 1967 to 1972, uh, helped establish uh, the uh, Natural Resources Defense Council, the Environmental Defense Fund, the Sierra Club Legal Defense Fund, uh, and other new law groups uh, with significant environmental uh, portfolios. Uh, and it's important, I think, to, to, to recognize that these organizations were all founded within a very short period of, period of time uh, in, the, in, the, in the context uh, of the uh, civil rights movement uh, and also uh, the height of the anti-war movement. Uh, and, uh, uh, and when the Nixon administration was, uh, was in power. Um, because it was the, civil, the civil rights uh, and anti-war movements were uh, uh, in extremely important uh, prods uh, to the founding of these kinds of public interest groups. They, they fueled uh, the belief uh, of these founders uh, that the government uh, was, was not necessarily to be trusted uh, and it needed to be watched over uh, and it needed to be uh, held accountable. The new uh, legal defense uh, organizations you know, as their names uh, suggest, you know, the, de the Defense Fund, the Defense Council, uh, uh, et cetera, um, they were directly inspired by the NAACP uh, legal defense uh, and education, uh, educational funds, uh, landmark civil rights and litigation against government institutions. Um, and so th this was all kind of of a, of a piece in, in this uh, particular uh, moment in time. It's also uh, at the moment of the uh, of Earth Day uh, and sort of rising environmental uh, uh, sentiment. Uh, uh, that, that, that was kind of the additional additional context. Uh, Gordon uh, Harrison, uh, the Ford uh, program officer who oversaw the uh, foundation's uh, environmental law grants, uh, he he clearly viewed uh, government agencies as the primary target uh, for these new uh, organizations. The law firms, uh, Harrison explained, needed to, quote, bring suits against uh, government agencies to oversee the performance of government agencies uh, and take other legal actions uh, to provide the agencies with a broader view of social interests than they normally get. Government, Harrison argued, should not be all powerful. He needed a, uh, quote, counterforce uh, to government that was not beholden to government uh, in any way. Ford's public interest grants, um, they aim to create a quote, antagonist of government uh, that would stay clearly within the bounds uh, of the American legal system. Uh, in fact, uh, becoming an integral part uh, of that system. Uh, and these, in, in the process, these, uh, these activists uh, outlined uh, a new understanding of uh, political economy. Uh, and it was one that saw uh, both, uh, both business and government uh, as flawed institutions uh, that needed to be counterbalanced. Um, they needed to be counterbalanced by a third sector, uh, one that consisted of uh, nonprofit uh, and public interest uh, organizations. Liberals had uh, long uh, emphasized that uh, market failures and, uh, and inefficiencies uh, justified the government's regulatory role uh, and the new environmental regulations uh, of early 1970s, uh, they very, very appropriately attempted uh, to remedy classic examples of uh, market failure, such as uh, air and uh, water pollution. Um, but the public interest organizations uh, themselves and the public interest advocates, um, they also aimed at a different problem. Some observers called, quote, and kind of a inelegant uh, term, uh, but they called it, uh, quote, government market failure. Uh, as a seminal uh, 1978 study of uh, um, 
a public interest law that was sponsored by the Ford Foundation that explained the public interest movement assumed both types of failures, uh, the market uh, and the government. Uh, the movement's adherents believe that, quote, political and economic pressures on the decision-making process caused failures that could be solved only by, quote, extra governmental efforts. So, the, so I guess what I'm describing is the way in which the public interest uh, movement uh, really reconceptualized uh, the policy uh, process. James uh, Mormon, uh, who was an early innovator in environmental law, uh, described the new situation as a, quote, triangular, uh, a triangular public interest model uh, of government. Uh, and it was one that he considered to be, quote, far better uh, than the earlier, quote, regulated versus regulator uh, model, kind of a dualistic uh, model. Uh, this triangular model uh, pitted public interest groups uh, against corporations and others uh, in a contest uh, to direct government policy. In the 1950s, uh, Mormon said, quote, it was assumed uh, it was assumed that government lawyers were public interest lawyers, uh, but that assumption uh, no longer held, uh, Mormon explained. The public interest existed separately uh, from the government. Citizens uh, who wanted uh, clean air and water, for example, they needed lawyers of their own uh, to represent them uh, before the government. And uh, during uh, the 1970s, this was part of a larger uh, reconceptualization of the policy process, not just limited to the environment, although that's my uh, principal uh, focus, but you also see uh, a lot of uh, policy advocacy and litigation by a, a range of other uh, public interest groups, you know, proliferating uh, across a, ra a wide range of issues, including uh, women's rights, uh, uh, civil rights, um, uh, mental health, poverty, criminal justice, uh, et cetera. So the, uh, the field of, uh, of public interest environmental law uh, that appeared uh, at the close of Lyndon Johnson's uh, presidency, uh, it, was, uh, it thus constituted an attack uh, on federal agencies uh, from within the liberal establishment uh, itself. Environmental law firms uh, created new independent law firm, uh, sorry, environmental lawyers created new independent law firms uh, to hold the government true uh, to a public purpose uh, that was going unfulfilled. Uh, either because private interest dominated uh, and captured uh, the, uh, um, the agencies uh, or because the agencies themselves uh, were isolated and misguided uh, bureaucratic fortresses. David Sieve, uh, a pioneering environmental lawyer active in the Sierra Club who was uh, an early uh, NRDC uh, trustee, um, describe the problem of pervasive bias uh, toward industry on the part of regulatory agencies. Quote, the Federal Power Commission is power oriented. The Atomic Energy Commission is atom oriented. The Interstate Commerce Commission is railroad oriented. The general interest, uh, that's the kind of broader public spirited uh, interest of the, that's represented by the environmental, new environmental organizations. The general interest was often fight not only the developer, which may be a private company, uh, but the very governmental agency, uh, which is supposed to regulate that company, uh, but because of the nature of things does not represent uh, the broad general interest. So this is uh, how these, these agencies are, are, are not representing the general interest and, and the citizen groups instead uh, are, are, are having to do it. Uh, Victor uh, Yanacone, um, uh, who was a, uh, the, the, was a combative uh, lawyer with the Environmental Defense Fund, uh, said in an Earth Day speech in 1970, quote, if we have to find a common denominator uh, for the serious environmental crises facing all technologically developed countries, regardless of their nominal form of government, it would have to be entrenched bureaucracies, uh, which are essentially immune uh, from criticism uh, or public action. Uh, by embracing a uh, legal strategy, uh, it represented a, a, a striking reversal uh, in, uh, in liberal thinking uh, about the different branches uh, of the government. Uh, this, this new uh, liberal faith uh, in, in courts uh, reversed uh, what had been a 1930s uh, approach to, to this uh, when liberals uh, touted independent executive agencies uh, you know, in, in the New Deal, uh, that independent executive agencies would be uh, the solution to major uh, social problems. But now in the 1960s, there'd been a, a, a sharp reversal uh, and the public interest lawyers instead um, appealed to the courts um, because administrative agencies were failing. Uh, they were, as, as Mormon said, um, administrative. We must, we must use the courts um, because administrative agencies are not working properly. 
Uh, and so when public interest lawyers, they boasted often you know, sort of uh, uh, brashly and uh, aggressively they, they, about their eagerness to sue the bastards. Uh, and when they did that, they, uh, they were, uh, you know, most often they were referring to lawsuits that were being filed against uh, government officials uh, and agencies. In one uh, typical uh, early report, 90% uh, of the uh, accomplishments cited by the Sierra Club Legal Defense Fund um, sought to block uh, government actions, uh, to intervene in public proceedings, uh, or to uh, influence government regulatory and permitting uh, practices. And the government uh, projects that were under attack, they included uh, new highways and bridges and airports and dams, the dredging of, high, of, of harbors, uh, pest control efforts, such as the DDT spray campaigns, uh, and also uh, water management uh, plans. And so if you look at this list here, um, with Volpe and Morton and Harden and Butts, these are all uh, you know, the heads of various uh, uh, you know, government uh, departments, agencies, uh, et cetera. Uh, in a, uh, you can also uh, see that, I'm uh, uh, oh, sorry, no, I thought I had another list. Uh, um, in, in a dramatic reversal of sentiment, uh, now the uh, Tennessee uh, Valley Authority, so I talked to earlier on about how uh, you know, Commager talking about the, the TVA as the uh, epitome of the great greatness of American democracy and how government was superior to, to the private sector or business. Um, now you have a very dramatic uh, reversal of sentiment uh, towards uh, the TVA itself. NRDC uh, in a fundraising letter from uh, 1971 said the TVA had once been a uh, benevolent agency. Uh, but now it, it once been a benevolent agency that gave every indication of dedication to public service. Uh, but now since the early sixties, it has been you know, strip mining uh, coal and turning beautiful mountains uh, into, uh, uh, into barren and acidic uh, wastelands and you know, rivers that are uh, uh, choked with pollution uh, where fish uh, can't, uh, can't survive. The very uh, success of uh, public interest uh, law um, led its uh, found elite founders, uh, Yale Law graduates, Harvard Law graduates, uh, many, uh, it, it was quite an elite uh, group, um, away from a move, more movement-centered approach to uh, social change. Uh, a, a, an approach that you know, would, might be more time-consuming, might be harder to control, uh, and perhaps also uh, uh, somewhat un unfamiliar. Um, the Environmental uh, Defense Fund uh, argued in an early uh, fundraising pitch um, that the group's litigation produced results faster uh, than by lobby, uh, by ballot box, uh, or by uh, protest. So they were, they were seeing themselves as uh, uh, representing an alternative uh, strategy within the uh, framework of the legal, uh, legal system, uh, an alternative to what was happening uh, uh, on the tumultuous uh, streets of the time. Uh, and this, this, uh, this direction of their, um, their, their legal strategy did, it didn't go unnoticed uh, or uh, un, uh, uncriticized. 1971, a meeting of public interest lawyers that was uh, organized by the Center for Law and Social Policy, uh, it erupted in uh, racial and uh, class uh, conflict uh, over the close ties between the major foundations, including the Ford Foundation, which I described as you know, giving a couple million dollars uh, to these you know, public interest groups, uh, the relationships between these foundations and leading public interest uh, law firms. George uh, Wiley, uh, a formidable and outspoken uh, African-American leader who headed up the uh, uh, National Welfare uh, Rights Organization criticized the exclusion of groups uh, like his uh, that were, were working on the front lines of the civil rights movement. Uh, and he you know, argued that public interest law firms uh, seem to pro be providing mainstream philanthropies like Ford uh, with a safe way uh, to do something about environmental and uh, civil rights uh, issues. Uh, but uh, public interest groups embraced uh, uh, professional expertise and inside the beltway strategies uh, rather than mass protests and uh, political action. Uh, and this was partly because uh, lawyers uh, uh, you know, often could, could halt uh, proposed uh, development projects, at least uh, temporarily, um, by intervening in administrative processes. Uh, for example, um, by demanding uh, and then uh, contesting uh, the environmental impact statements required by the National Environmental Policy Act of 1969. In one uh, early demonstration of these uh, legal superpowers, uh, the Center for Law and Social Policy that I was just uh, mentioning, uh, which was at that point, it was, it was really just a, a tiny uh, law firm, it was just a couple months old, um, uh, won a court order in uh, March 1970 that halted construction uh, of the Trans-Alaska uh, Pipeline. Quote, um, 
at that moment, I was so overcome uh, that all the voices and the scene uh, just faded into the distance, said uh, James Mormon, who I was just been referencing before, uh, who was the lead lawyer uh, on the suit. Um, he, he, this was his recollection of this seductive moment uh, when David uh, defeated uh, Goliath. Quote, I've never had an experience quite like it. Never have I accomplished anything in the practice of law, uh, which has had such an emotional impact uh, on me uh, as that uh, injunction uh, injunction did. They were operating out of a uh, dingy office uh, of only a handful of lawyers in uh, Washington DuPont Circle, uh, and Mormon and his uh, colleagues uh, had helped to stop, you know, obviously just temporarily, um, but had helped to stop one of the uh, most costly uh, and ambitious engineering projects uh, in, in U.S. history. So in the uh, later part of my book, I discussed the Carter years, uh, the 1980 election uh, and its aftermath. Um, and uh, uh, running in the uh, for office in the aftermath of, of the uh, deception of Watergate, the Vietnam War, Jimmy Carter promised to take a new broom to Washington uh, and to sweep the House of Government clean. As president, uh, Carter sought to incorporate uh, the 1970s public interest critique of government into a positive vision uh, of government action uh, and reform. Uh, and he placed uh, dozens of uh, public interest lawyers in important government positions uh, where they could shape the agencies that they've been suing and pressuring. Carter uh, took to heart the idea that the government might be uh, responsible for wasteful and environmentally destructive projects, uh, and he was willing to spend valuable uh, political capital uh, clashing with powerful congressional Democrats over the construction of uh, big dams, uh, for example. He also shared uh, the view that federal regulation had resulted in cartel-like control of major industries, including the airline sector, telecommunications, and trucking. Uh, and he supported the breakup of these arrangements. Many uh, regulatory agencies, Carter said bluntly in 1980, quote, protect monopolies. Carter also sought to uh, introduce more flexible regulatory strategies um, that could, could uh, uh, achieve environmental and health protection goals uh, at lesser economic uh, cost. Yet Carter uh, ultimately failed to create a new liberalism uh, that could champion both champion federal action uh, while also uh, recognizing government's flaws uh, and limitations. Although public interest advocates outside the administration, uh, they sometimes uh, supported uh, aspects of the president's reform efforts, they more often harshly criticized uh, the Carter administration uh, for its compromises uh, and its inadequacies. Uh, and it's a great, uh, a great example of this tension uh, uh, was uh, encapsulated uh, when uh, Ralph Nader called for his former ally, uh, uh, close colleague, Joan Claybrook's uh, resignation in 1977 uh, over the, imp the, the delayed implementation of the airbag uh, mandate. Here he is at a press conference kind of slightly looming over uh, Claybrook uh, and pressing her to, uh, to resign, uh, resign her position. Attacking uh, the government was what uh, people like Nader uh, uh, knew, knew how to do. Uh, and it was really the role that they had defined for themselves. Uh, and as Carter's term in office proceeded, uh, the public interest movement's support uh, for the Democratic president uh, diminished. In 1979, for instance, uh, Carter reluctantly signed uh, a bill authorizing a uh, controversial dam project uh, despite environmental litigation under the Endangered uh, Species Act. Marion uh, Eddy, uh, the director of the League of Conservation of Voters, announced that Carter could, uh, not, uh, uh, could not feel assured of active support anymore from uh, environmentalists. Uh, Edie uh, had, was a former ally. Uh, Carter had tried unsuccessfully to employ, uh, appoint her to the Council on Environmental Quality, but now she declared, quote, I cannot say we will or will not support the president for re-election. Uh, Nader uh, similarly wondered aloud that same year, uh, what could Ronald Reagan do, uh, he said. Uh, uh, so disappointed liberals flirted first with uh, Ted Kennedy's unsuccessful challenge to Carter in the Democratic primary, uh, and Kennedy's a robust effort uh, to push the sitting Democratic president off the ticket, uh, recalled one uh, Carter appointee who had come out of the Nader network. It, it helped strip away, quote, the traditional support that the left uh, uh, had, uh, and it left the reelection campaign somewhat without a theme. The public really didn't have anything uh, to hang on uh, onto as sort of their reason in wanting to reelect uh, this president. Disappointment with the uh, um, Carter administration also fed a broad critique of both parties uh, and the political establishment. Rather than boost Carter's efforts to stay in power, uh, Nader declared in mid-1979 that the two-party system was, quote, crumbling and bankrupt, 
uh, and the differences between the two major parties were like those between, quote, Tweedledum and Tweedledee. A new political party was needed, Nader said, quote, it's time to replace the two party system with new parties, new spirit, new programs, new constituencies, and new optimism. Some literal, liberal critics of Carter uh, embraced the independent candidacy of John Anderson, a Republican who had opposed the Vietnam War and embraced the equal rights amendment, uh, gay rights and environmental causes. Uh, and the ecologist uh, Barry Commoner also uh, plunged into a third party uh, presidential campaign on the new Citizens Party uh, ticket. The third party campaigns uh, illustrated a uh, disunity on the left uh, that weakened Carter's reelection campaign. And they also uh, foreshadowed uh, Nader's 2000 run, uh, undercutting Al Gore uh, 20 years later. Now, of course, liberal disarray was hardly the only reason that Carter lost to Reagan in uh, 1980 uh, and that the Republican Party uh, took control of the U.S. Senate for the first time uh, since uh, 1955. Uh, you had high inflation and unemployment, the Iran the hostage crisis, all these uh, created stiff headwinds uh, for Carter's reelection uh, and for the Democratic Party. The Republican Party's uh, continuing Southern strategy on civil rights also helped uh, to remake the party's uh, coalitions uh, and further contributed to Carter's defeat. Uh, but Kennedy's primary challenge uh, and Anderson's third party candidacy uh, took their toll. The uh, public interest uh, critique of government, uh, it held, uh, those, held up those in power against the model uh, of what they might be uh, rather than what the push and pull of political compromise uh, and struggle allowed. Uh, it raised the, the raised the question, uh, could liberals in the left uh, build political power uh, and could they govern? Uh, and Carter's failure uh, to hold together the Democratic coalition uh, and to win a re-election uh, suggested the answer uh, might be no. Liberals uh, attacked uh, and they criticized uh, and then they lost control uh, of both the government uh, and the narrative that surrounded it. Nonprofit uh, issue-based advocacy uh, had become a potent and permanent force in US politics. Uh, but now an emboldened and ever more conservative Republican Party uh, threatened the public interest movement's fight to protect health, safety, uh, and the environment. Reagan also attacked uh, government agencies. Um, uh, here he is uh, with a, a meat cleaver that James Watt uh, gave him with a copy of the Code of Federal Regulations split in two, a kind of uh, jest that was it captured the hostility to uh, uh, regulations of the 70s. Um, so Ray, Reagan also attacked government agencies, but his policy solutions differed radically uh, from the ones that were touted by liberals uh, and the left. Um, Reagan and other market-oriented uh, conservatives sought to liberate the private sector from regulation. He uh, acted to undermine rather than invigorate federal oversight. Instead of seeing a role for citizen activists who are pressing the government uh, to do more uh, and to do better, Reagan went back to uh, the previous uh, duality of state versus market. Uh, and in this case, he sided uh, with the market, uh, with regulated industries, uh, against government regulators, uh, and also against labor unions. So Reagan's election you know, really definitively marked uh, the end of uh, New Deal liberalism, uh, a period during which Americans had optimistically looked uh, to the federal government for solutions. Um, but focusing solely on Reagan's uh, playing of uh, big government and the growing strength of the conservative movement, I think overlooks exactly how uh, the post-World War II administrative uh, state lost its footing. Uh, and that's what I've been trying to uh, explain here, just the ways in which liberal advocates uh, had spent the 1960s and the 1970s um, amply and harshly uh, documenting the government's problems. And now uh, many public interest advocates found themselves making a kind of uh, about face in the early uh, 1980s. Uh, and their efforts, uh, somewhat ironically, uh, their, their efforts to safeguard the government's regulatory role uh, uh, after Reagan's election pushed them uh, into a defensive position of defending the administrative state uh, that only years before uh, they, they'd often treated uh, as, as the problem. In the stark uh, right-left uh, stalemate that, uh, that followed, uh, liberals could easily lose sight of the, uh, uh, of the 1970s, uh, their 1970s dilemma, which is, uh, how could liberals make a strong case for government uh, as an essential uh, solution to societal problems uh, while continuing to expose all the ways uh, that government agencies could wield destructive power uh, against citizens, against communities, uh, and against the environment? So uh, just a, a few thoughts, uh, a little bit to, to wrap up here. Um, public interest advocates uh, showed uh, how both uh, markets and government uh, are inherently uh, limited and flawed. 
Uh, yet so too was the uh, public interest advocacy that Nader and others helped pioneer. Uh, the movement's uh, emphasis on purity uh, and its frequent disdain for traditional uh, institutions, including political parties uh, and, uh, and union and often unions, uh, turn many liberals uh, away from local and uh, state politics uh, and from the pursuit of uh, institutional power uh, necessary to pursue uh, uh, a political to make make and to pursue uh, political change. Policy gains that were uh, reliant on professional expertise uh, and administrative maneuvering uh, failed uh, to inspire a broad and powerful movement uh, that could bridge gaps across uh, class uh, and race. And the movement's uh, litigation strategies, which were so strikingly successful uh, for the left in the 1970s, uh, they, these, these strategies were also uh, soon ad uh, adopted by conservative antagonists uh, and, 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 and also stifled increasingly uh, by a conservative uh, judiciary. Even uh, founders of the public interest movement have come to reassess uh, its strategy uh, and accomplishments. James uh, Gustav, uh, Gustav Smith, Gus Smith, uh, NRDC uh, co-founder and the former Dean of the Yale School of the Environment um, explained in his memoir, uh, Angels by the River, quote, these new laws, you know, referring to, you know, neat National Environmental Policy Act and other laws, the early 1970s, created major opportunities for lawyers and others to make large environmental gains. But in doing so, we were drawn ever more completely inside the DC beltway. Once there inside the system, we were compelled to a certain uh, tameness by the need to succeed there. We opted to work within the system of political economy that we found, uh, and we neglected to seek transformation uh, of the system uh, itself. Additionally, citizen-based strategies uh, used to prevent overdevelopment and uh, protect the environment, including uh, such legislative crown jewels uh, as NEPA or in California, more recently, the California Environmental Quality Act, um, have uh, uh, been increasingly uh, criticized and studied uh, uh, for the ways in which they might make it difficult to respond to major societal problems by building housing, transportation, uh, and renewable energy infrastructure, uh, and things like the uh, larger transmission grid uh, uh, or offshore wind and things like that. Empowering uh, citizen activism and amplifying uh, citizen voices seen from another uh, vantage point you know, also could shift uh, power from broadly representative government bodies uh, to narrow uh, self-organized groups uh, that might protect a particular interest, uh, such as the value uh, of a private uh, property. By primarily playing the role of uh, uncompromising outside critic, the public interest movement neglected uh, to build support for government in a way that could facilitate policymaking in a politically divided nation, uh, or that could support internal reforms uh, that might improve government operations. Americans uh, today uh, are, are struggling, uh, continue to struggle to formulate uh, an approach to governance uh, that acknowledges uh, and strives to balance uh, the inherent limitations of government, markets, uh, and also uh, citizen action. Uh, a half century later, the regulatory accomplishments of the early 1970s, uh, you know, many of those are clear. Uh, they have you know, provided a, leg a legal framework that somewhat constrains US capitalism. Uh, the nation's air and its water are cleaner, its workplaces are safer. Uh, but at the same time, uh, government itself is unpopular uh, and of often incapable of action uh, that addresses new threats, uh, especially uh, climate change. So our challenge, uh, in, our, in my view, is, is to continue uh, to struggle uh, to both uh, reinvigorate the government uh, and also to fight to improve it uh, and continue uh, to hold it accountable. Uh, so thank you uh, for your uh, patience uh, and for listening and uh, be eager to take your questions. I'm sure there's lots uh, here, uh, here to talk about. Thank you, Professor Sabin. Really wonderful and concise presentation. I'm amazed at how much history you were able to put into such a short period of time. Uh, I want to just remark for everyone's benefit that your book, Public Citizens, which was published in um, 2021, is available for purchase at the Yale Bookstore. And I certainly encourage all of you, um, the professors who come to give us presentations, I accidentally muted myself. The professors who come to give us presentations do so uh, just out of their kindness and generosity to contribute to the Yale community. And so it's wonderful for us to contribute and support their research and scholarship um, by supporting their books. So I would encourage you to, um, to take a look at Professor Sabin's book and I will put a link in the chat uh, how you can order a copy of it.
signed copy. He signed for all of us at Yale Alumni Academy. Uh, I want to go to our Q&A portion of the presentation. We have a little bit of time for questions, about 20 minutes. And I'd like to ask if you, if you don't mind, please, could you put your questions in the Q&A box and not in the chat? That will help me keep track uh, of all of the questions. And I, I, I know a, um, a couple of questions that are here, and I know a couple of you are still formulating the questions that you want to ask. I have some questions of my own as well. So uh, I want to just kind of throw out um, one, Professor Sabin, which is, it, it almost seems like if I were going to summarize, if I were going to go home and tell someone what I learned from today's presentation, <laughs> In one Besides that I don't know how to use technology. <laughs> no, it would be, well, it would be that Ralph Nader did both a great service and a lot of damage to the um, public environmental movement. And I wonder if, how you would respond to that. I, I, I don't want to focus too much on Nader uh, specifically, but I, I, I think that, um, you know, I, I th and it just goes back to my earlier, my comments at the very outset of the presentation of both trying to uh, kind of bring some perspective to, you know, to this story. And, and I think, uh, and that does uh, allow us to both see some of the tremendous uh, contributions of, uh, you know, of someone uh, like Nader to you know, passage of the Clean Air Act and the Clean Water Act and uh, occupational safety and health uh, and uh, auto safety. So all of us, you know, using seatbelts and airbags and getting, you know, if you get in a car accident, you're grateful to Ralph Nader, uh, but that's, but that's, but that's, but much more than that. Um, uh, he's often just reduced to automobiles and, and he was involved in much more than that. So I think, yes, tremendous uh, accomplishments. Um, but I think that, uh, but, you know, but, but this is an opportunity yeah, to, to, to look at some of the, uh, the complexity of that story and, and ways in which it may have led to some counterintuitive uh, results. And that's not, and so not just, uh, you know, whatever, you know, interpretation you want to take on the 2000 election, which, you know, people, you know, want to, want to talk about his role in that, but more broadly, uh, the, the ways in which we have uh, struggled to build support for government, government uh, power, uh, for uh, um, building uh, uh, so social movements, uh, political power. So yes, I think, yeah, I mean, I guess that's a little long-winded answer to say, Positives and negatives. Yeah, I think that's, uh, that's, you know, I'm a historian, so I like to look at both sides of these things. Yes. Okay. Um, and I wonder what you would think about, I just, I'm, I'm brimming with questions of my own, but I also want to, <laughs> um, want to make sure that we attend to the participants questions. So I want to go to Dorothy, who says, thank you for the synthesis. What is the relationship of a state being successful in protecting the environment um, to the concurrent national efforts? Uh, let's see. So I'm not sure. I, I guess I'm taking state there as being a state government, maybe as opposed to in relationship to uh, to national uh, national mm -hmm. efforts. And yep. I think that that is, uh, uh, you know, we live in a we live in a federal system, and uh, um, so it's a complicated uh, a complicated dynamic. Uh, sometimes the states are uh, uh, are leaders, uh, and uh, other times they're followers, and uh, uh, and it's a you know very, just a very complicated dynamic. So there's no um, one. Uh, you know, you can see states like California as aggressively leading on clean air. Um, actually, California's clean air legislation predated uh, some of the national uh, efforts, and they've been granted an exception. And then other states have followed uh, California. And you know, with California being as large as you know many countries, uh, it is able to drive you know big changes in the auto market and uh, and other other technologies. Um, so so really a, a pathbreaker, uh, uh, you know, a leader there. Um, so I I, th I think you can see. Um, you know, opportunities for state innovation, uh, and particularly when you're in, a, and you could see that during the prior administration uh, to our current one, uh, when there was a lot of uh, pa uh, passivity or outright hostility to environmental uh, regulation, uh, you could see state governments uh, trying to step up and uh, and use their independent, you know, constitutional prerogatives uh, or other you know legal rights uh, to, uh, to, to take action. And so, uh, uh, those are times when one is, you know, grateful to be in a federal system, uh, when states, uh, can, can take, uh, can take initiative, but it's also clear that states alone, um, uh, are not able to solve many of our problems, uh, because, you know, there can be a race to the bottom between states and, uh, and many of the problems, you know, are, are greater than any one state. Okay. Yeah. You, um, I'm glad that you bring up that point between, you know, state and, and federal, because I think there's there's a lot of rich material we can explore there. Um, I want to go to Deepti's question, which is sort of adjacent 
to this topic of state versus federal, it's trying to pull out a broader look at um, holding the, the government accountable for actions that affect people nationally, but also affect people locally. So um, Deep D points to um, campaign finance reform, police brutality against people of color, and just says, are there some topics that are better addressed inside the Beltway and others that are better addressed through a confrontational or adversarial approach? Um, should we think about taking action on climate change differently than taking action on some of these other things like campaign finance reform? Uh, great, yeah, great, great question. And a shout out to uh, DT, former colleague here from, from Yale who studies uh, cook stove technology. Uh, uh, over, you know, internationally and uh, wonderful uh, gender analysis of, uh, you know, ad adoption of stoves and um, uh, great question, you know, thinking about inside the Beltway approach and, uh, and, and outside. And I think that, you know, there are, you know, I, I mean, that, that going back to, you know, Gus Speth's comment about, uh, you know, the seductiveness of uh, litigation, uh, you know, clearly there were, there are all these opportunities for uh, public interest law to accomplish tremendous amount, you know, in the 1970s by intervening in administrative processes and uh, leveraging the, the power uh, of those uh, to make, uh, to make change. But I think that, um, you know, that then hit a wall uh, uh, in, in part because something, yeah, some things weren't as, as susceptible to, uh, to the legal challenges, uh, but but also the law itself uh, began to began to change. Um, I mean, I think something like climate change is is a very interesting uh, one. I was talking about that in my energy history uh, course the other day, comparing uh, climate change to uh, uh, the ozone hole and the Montreal Protocol to address the uh, problem of uh, uh, ozone depletion and just. Uh, I mean, climate is such a uh, sort of economy-wide, society-wide issue uh, compared to something uh, like uh, the Montreal Protocol, which phased out chlorofluorocarbons and uh, and helped to uh, um, repair, uh, bring, bring allow allow the ozone hole to kind of repair, I guess, repair itself. Um, and I think it's a good example of the issue that is susceptible to uh, an inside the Beltway uh, approach. Um, that was really a, 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 a solution that was developed by uh, you know, national governments and uh, major companies uh, and, uh, and experts you know, figure, you know, coming, coming to an agreement. Um, uh, whereas climate change is, you know, is really about you know, remaking land use and transportation and, uh, and so much. And, and, and it's not something that can be accomplished uh, you know, simply uh, within an inside the Beltway strategy. Uh, it, it requires a full you know, sort of societal wide uh, mobilization uh, on all, all different fronts. And, and, and that's why it's really just such a challenging, uh, challenging issue. Well, and it seemed like with that slide, you were kind of making the point that that was one of the steps toward sort of the weakening of the federal government's ability to act on climate change was the, the sort of seduction of activists inside the beltway. Is, well, is I think that if, really what you yeah, no, I think that's I think that's a great question because I, th I think if you look at what's happened in the, in the environmental uh, movement in, in the past few decades, there's, there's really, really been a certain amount of uh, uh, self-reflection and uh, uh, a realization that uh, the seductiveness of the inside the beltway strategies and building up technical expertise and elite strategies, you know, ha had 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 uh, not resulted in, in a broader you know set of political coalitions, uh, a broader um, uh, uh, you know, and, and this was particularly acute on issues of environmental justice uh, that that Deep D was referencing, um, and uh, with environmental justice organizations attacking the big national groups and and accusing them of um, you know not being representative and not uh, 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 actively undermining a community interest. Um, and uh, yeah, so I think that's what, uh, you know, Smith was talking about is, is an idea that you have to have a broader kind of movement, a broader political strategy and social strategy. And if you're just kind of working within administrative processes, um, you know, you're, 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 you're not gonna, uh, the, the political environment uh, will change around you. And those processes, as we've seen, you know, will no longer uh, even, even accomplish the same thing that they did once it's, uh, you know, at, at one time, so. I, I wanna follow that up with Anne's question. Anne says, I'm surprised by the number of public interest groups formed and supported by the Ford Foundation in the period from 67 to 72. And you listed seven groups um, in your presentation. Do you think we would have been better off with fewer groups and that the plethora of groups might have contributed to a failure to maintain control of the narrative and to support the development of broad social movements? 
Hmm, that's, that's, that's a very interesting, uh, interesting question. So the first thing I would just say just about that period, just to reiterate, you know, there's how, uh, you know, it, it is, this, it's just so striking that it's the, you know, the peak of, uh, you know, anti-war activism, you know, Nixon, uh, and, and, and we, people talked about the resistance, you know, move, you know, in, in you know, recent years, uh, litigation against the government that was, was happening. Um, this was sort of like that. Um, and, uh, uh, and so it was an outpouring, but I, I think you, re, you, re, you raise a really interesting point about this. It was really about um, uh, the rights-based litigation uh, uh, strategy. Um, there was a segmenting out of the uh, uh, of a kind of marketplace of litigation uh, to different groups, and uh, and and that led to less integrated strategies. And and part of that is if you're going to pursue an issue in the court. Um, you often need to pursue a very specific issue, uh, not a, uh, a constellation of a, a kind of a coalition of issues. Uh, it's, that's not the kind of thing that a court <laughs> usually resolves. Um, and so uh, uh, I, I think that it did lead to a segmentation uh, and also the, the, you see a differentiation of the organizations, you know, where they're sort of uh, like an ecosystem differentiating themselves into different uh, niches to uh, uh, create an identity and be allow themselves to survive, you know, financially and institutionally. Um, and uh, yeah, so I, I think you raise an interesting question. It's a counterfactual. It's hard to know, you know, if there have been, you know, just five of these instead of, you know, many more, uh, what would have happened? I, I can't quite answer that. Okay, uh, lots of good questions coming in. Um, I want to go to David's question. Given the pull, push and pull of the left and right over the past 50 plus years, resulting in a hollowing out of our administrative state, how would you envision a regeneration of competence, capacity, and moral suasion for the administrative state? Is there really a path forward to the rigor that we need and require? Well, this is the liberal dilemma uh, that I try to uh, you know, try to draw out, which is the um, legacy of the uh, of criticism of the of the government, um, with the uh, with the effort to boost the government and embrace and uh, and and empower it. And I think that's the you know that's the delicate you know kind of fine line that I think liberal. It's a complex. Thing to be trying to communicate that we both need to be uh, reforming and criticizing and challenging the government and making it do better and represent you know more people and there and be more equitable and more just and uh, and and uh, more uh, uh, all the things that it needs to do better. Um, but at the same time, uh, we have to we have to celebrate it. Uh, you know that the government is representing the public interest, and uh, you know that, that that the government embodies our collective uh, efforts to try to uh, you know accomplish uh, things together. So I think it's a real it's a real rhetorical challenge, and I think that's part of why it's been uh, been so difficult. Um, but I think that there needs to be uh, a celebration of public service uh, and uh, an encouragement of people to uh, you know to pursue public service and to to try to find. Uh, uh, their way and, and to build up public institutions, you know, from the local level all the way up to uh, to the national and even even international. Uh, and uh, so we need to find a way to uh, both be, you know, external reformers and, and overseers of the government uh, while also, you know, building it up. It, it, it's challenging, but, but it has to be done. Well, I think it's a really interesting point that you make, you know, going back to something we mentioned earlier, which is sort of the balance between the state and the federal and the way that you tell the story, um, you know, this, the outsiders to Washington were much more sort of a, of a powerful group at that time in the 1960s and 1970s. And then they sort of transitioned into being insiders and we're, mm -hmm. we're coming full circle now to where we need the outsiders to, to wield a lot of influence that the insiders simply can't. Yeah, I think one, one thing that I think is striking about the, just in thinking about state and federal, uh, one one thing that that, that I've observed uh, uh, related to uh, uh, liberal attitude towards government is, is a is has often been a uh, a very strong focus on the national and on on the federal, uh, and I think that that is a legacy you know of the civil rights movement and uh, the idea of you know federal uh, national solutions uh, and also the national courts you know coming out of the 60s and 70s a lot of the litigation that I'm re referencing is happening uh, in federal courts and on federal laws um, and uh, and it's led to uh, kind of a sense of disparagement towards uh, you know state governments and uh, um, state political parties 
uh, uh, as being too parochial, maybe corrupt or uh, in backwater, you know, that, those kinds of ideas. Um, and I think that they're uh, only in the most recent, you know, recent years, maybe the last five or, or 10 or, or so, uh, a, a re-embrace of the state and the local uh, as a, a, a vehicle for uh, you know, progressive, you know, liberal, liberal reform at, at a more, in a more aggressive way. Well, and I think the, the climate movement, you know, climate change and the movement to address it really raises the importance of acting locally. And, you know, we've had other presenters come on from um, School of Public Health who talked about how you can really impact um, the public health implications of climate through local action. Um, and I, I, you know, I think other points have been raised. I know Ming Wang brings up the point about housing supply housing policy. And, um, you know, there seems to be a resurgence of awareness of the importance of acting locally and how that can lead to significant change at the state level and the federal level. But those yeah. local coalitions are perhaps not as strong as they were in the 1960s and 1970s. So I wonder if you could comment on that. Well, I, mean, I think there is uh, renewed attention to, uh, to, the importance of all levels of uh, of government and uh, and uh, housing is, is an interesting one that, that there's both interest in trying to address it you know at state 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 levels or maybe even national levels, um, but uh, often it is a very local uh, local issue related to you know zoning and uh, um, you know neighborhoods and uh, and really articulating a positive uh, you know vision for the need for uh, need for more housing. Um, but I, I've been very you know interested in the in, in the you know, recent developments on on housing. Uh, and the ways in which that has led to a criticism of some of the um, uh, initiative of the uh, 60s and 70s, which was often sort of anti-growth uh, and anti-development. Uh, and now there, uh, there's a lot of frustration for, uh, about uh, high cost of housing, uh, the lack of construction that's going on and, uh, and the ways in which you know, environmental laws and, and, and public participation is being used to block uh, the creation of public goods in, in the form of uh, affordable housing or even just any any uh, additional uh, housing uh, units. So you can see that a lot with the uh, the, the the yes in my backyard, you know, the Yimby uh, movement out in, uh, in in California and elsewhere. So it's a, a very interesting new development. Well, I'm glad to, you kind of moved to new development because as we wrap up in our last couple of minutes of conversation, I, I want to talk about the parallels and connections between the period of time that you presented about. And um, a lot of people are asking questions about the Biden administration. And I, I wanna kick it off with um, a news headline from, from today, which is a number of profiles that have talked about um, Judge Catherine Kimball Mizell and her mask mandate, um, you know, striking down the federal mask mandate policy. And I bring it up because you make the point about um, Ralph Nader being the person we should thank for the seatbelt laws that we have. And it's, it's easy to forget that there was a time when people debated over seatbelts in the way that they're debating over the importance of wearing masks in a pandemic, for example. Um, and so here you have a federal judge in the state of, of Florida determining national federal policy on, um, on a public health concern that is arguably also a climate, you know, a climate concern. And so I just wonder if you can if you can speak to the connections there, how these you know the weakening of the federal ability to enforce something like masking is reflected now also in the weakening of the federal ability to address these kinds of climate concerns. Yeah. Well, I, I mean that, that's a, that's an interesting uh, question. I, mean, I, th I think one. Uh, aspect of that is, you know, I mentioned how many of the the legislative technique, you know, techniques or tools of uh, liberal public interest advocates have been adopted by other groups, you know, after you know, uh, you know since the '70s, and this is, and that the courts themselves became, you know, less favorable to uh, liberal interpretation. So the idea of going to a federal court and trying to uh, uh, get an injunction and and uh, affect national change of some kind that is very consistent with the liberal public interest strategy, uh, but the result of it is is in many ways, you know, the opposite uh, of that. Um, uh, and is the you know this is a recently appointed uh, you know, more conservative judge uh, intervening to block uh, a public health uh, mandate and 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 uh, strip some power away from uh, a public health uh, agency. Um, so 
uh, I think you, can, you know, so, so, so that's uh, very, very striking in terms of the dynamic and, and is, is just a sign of how, um, you know, the courts have really become much less receptive uh, to this uh, with the Supreme Court um, starting to articulate these ideas that, uh, you know, that the agencies are not able to uh, undertake certain kinds of regulation unless Congress has a very, very explicitly, you know, detailed uh, uh, how, uh, you know, approach to climate uh, as part of the Clean Air Act or th things like that. Um, and so what that really does is force, uh, um, if the legal strategies aren't working, it, it forces an attention to political strategies, uh, you know, that you need to somehow find a way to produce, you know, congressional uh, action or, or other type of political uh, solutions. Um, so, I, 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 th I th yeah, there's a, there's, a, there's a lot of resonance, you know, right now to... Uh, um, um, to back then, uh, and partly because I think that the you know the period between 1968 and 72 in the Nixon years, um, and uh, I mean, you know, ha has has some resemblance to the Trump administration, just in terms of the uh, um, the dynamic of the uh, groups uh, outside of uh, the administration and the administration itself, the combative the, the combative relationship there. Uh, you know, and you saw many of the groups that actually were founded years ago, including some of the public interest groups kind of uh, suing the government and challenging the government over, you know, over uh, immigration, over environment, uh, over all sorts of different kinds of things. Uh, and then you have, uh, um, yeah, you, 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 now it's like the aftermath of that uh, with a new, a new president and uh, so much uh, ambition, you know, with the Build Back Better, so much, uh, so many ambitions about what could be accomplished or should be accomplished. Um, uh, but the uh, comp finding a way to compromise on politically successful strategies is, uh, you know, ha has been somewhat more difficult. Okay, um, I'm going to sort of wrap in terms of the questions with sure. with one point that someone made and two questions, and I'll just let you kind of comment off of these. Um, David notes that there's a contradic contradiction between the simplistic view of the government as serving the public versus being viewed as the public enemy. And so I just wanna offer that comment. So I think it's interesting that David raised. And then Vicky um, kind of follows that up by saying, I'm struck by the statement that once government lawyers were actually public interest lawyers and that now there's a sort of a lack of trust in government as representative of the people. I think that's interesting because I think the lack of trust is on both sides, liberal and conservative. Um, and then I'll finish with uh, Rosella's question, which is the early successes of uh, TVA infrastructure projects served to build faith in big government. Is there room for optimism with the Biden administration's uh, infrastructure investments? Do you see particular potential for these projects that are in the works or any projects that are in the works that we should be keeping an eye out for and supporting? So really with these three, I'm getting at the tension between trusting and not trusting the government, big government being viewed as a positive versus negative, and then sort of extracting those themes to what the Biden administration is currently doing and how liberals yeah. get behind it or don't. Well, I mean, I think the issue about trusting, uh, you know, seeing the government as, as serving the public and representing the public is uh, uh, well also criticizing it. Um, that you know, to say sort of again that that, that that's really the fundamental challenge, uh, which is, uh, I, I, I you know I believe that I, 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 the public interest movement you know may had a very, had an important insight that uh, concentrated power and government bureaucracies uh, can be uh, can be wielded in ways that is uh, you know ways that are oppressive uh, and uh, destructive. Um, you know the the quintessential example of that you know looming over uh, much of uh, uh, the post-war period, you know, was, were, you know, were things like, uh, you know, the atmospheric testing of nuclear weapons um, and, uh, um, you know, just a, uh, of how the government could go so awry uh, and, um, and the need for people, you know, citizens and others to rise up and challenge, uh, challenge uh, that. Um, so I, th I think that the question is like, how, how do you communicate, how, how do you uh, communicate something that's, compli that's, that's complicated, you know, that, that is <laughs> nuanced, uh, that we both need the government. I, I, I'm repeating myself to some extent, but we, you know, we need the government. We have to, uh, it's, it's a public service to represent the public and try to deliver public services to, you know, goods uh, through, through, the, through these public institutions. Um, but they, uh, 
they have their flaws and tendencies and uh, and there's a need for there to be some mechanisms for accountability and uh, um, and so that's that's the challenge of like how to hold these ideas together into one package uh, and I think it's 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 quite difficult but that's what I'm uh, sort of advocating uh, for in terms of what to hope for uh, and I, I, I guess I, the one thing I would emphasize one of the really more truly hopeful things of our time. Uh, is the uh, plummeting uh, plummeting prices uh, of uh, solar and wind energy and you know renewables uh, and the possibilities that those offer uh, uh, you know related to climate change uh, and, and you can see the you know in significant impact there and I think that any infrastructure so the question was about infrastructure uh, any investments you know that accelerate uh, the the decline in those prices. Um, and uh, the ability of the uh, you know the, the nation to switch over to uh, non-carbon uh, based fuels, I think, are really uh, really essential, and uh, we can be optimistic about that to the extent that we can mobilize government to spend money to uh, you know pursue those goals. Well, one thing is for sure: there's no progress on these tensions between public interest and and government power unless we talk about them, and I agree. so that's why your book <laughs> is very important. Um, Public Citizens is the book, and I encourage all of you to order a signed copy. Professor Sabin has signed for us. Um, putting a link again in the chat so that you can do that. And thank you so much, Professor Sabin. I know you're headed off to a class <laughs> soon, but I want to give you the last word if there's anything else that you wanted to say. Uh, no, just appreciate everyone. Uh, you know, is interested in, in in the book and the topic, and uh, uh, and and uh, in environmental history and humanities. Uh, yeah, I look forward to uh, other opportunities to connect with you on, on these themes. So, thanks for coming today. All right. Well, thank you. Have a great day, everyone, and we'll see you on the next one. Great. Thanks so much. Bye. Bye.